All right, it's time to look into what's trending in employment law. Lawyer, you're on the clock. So the first one that I want to talk about really does hit close to home for me, as many of our uh, listeners know, but I'm going to try to keep, uh, obviously, my, my own positions out of this. I found the story itself really interesting. Uh, the Starbucks uh, Corporation and their workers union have sued each other over pro-Palestinian social media posts. So this is a fight between Starbucks and its own union now. The coffee giant wants workers united, Starbucks workers united, to stop using its logo after it posted messages backing Palestinians and condemning Israel in wake of uh, Hamas's assault on Israel. So uh, what's really interesting here, Starbucks sued their own union, Starbucks workers united in federal court in Iowa, saying that those pro-Palestinian social media posts from a union account earlier in this war angered hundreds of customers and damaged its reputation. They're suing for trademark infringement, demanding that Starbucks Workers United stop using the name Starbucks Workers United, and uh, also to stop using a circular green logo that resembles the Starbucks logo. In response to this, the union, Starbucks Workers United, responded with its own filing, asking a federal court in Pennsylvania to rule that it can continue to use Starbucks name and a similar logo. And the Workers United also said Starbucks defamed the union by implying that it supports Mm -hmm. terrorism and violence. Uh, So really kind of an interesting fight here going on between the union and the company itself. We know that they've been uh, really quite antagonistic with one another uh, as as, uh, the union has attempted to uh, organize, sometimes successfully, many Starbucks locations throughout the country. And that is, uh, I don't know, to me, that's just very shameful approach to um, to draw an attention to yourself. But I got to believe that's going to be very president setting in the sense that uh, would you be at, this case may determine how those brands may or may not be used uh, in the future as it relates to political positioning. Yeah, I I think uh, we'll really have to keep our eye on these cases and see uh, it could impact really how unions use logos and the names of their employers uh, moving forward. So anyway, really kind of an interesting case uh, in the news, hot hot topic right now. I know you'll be following that. So keep us up to date on that, please. Yeah, of course. Uh, Sticking on the on the union uh, uh, union. Uh, issue. I thought this one was somewhat amusing. So, Bill, we've talked before in the past that there's sort of a union of the unions, and most people are aware of it. It's called the AFL-CIO. And the AFL-CIO basically uh, has about 60 unions that are members of the AFL-CIO. They're basically, it's sort of synonymous with the American labor movement. It's a 67-year-old umbrella group Uh, That includes the Federation of Teachers, the American Postal Workers Union, the Writers Guild of America. They represent about 12.5 million workers. Uh, They represent the auto workers. And what's really interesting here is that the AFL-CIO, the sort of umbrella group of unions, uh, last week, their staffers actually picketed in Washington, D.C., their union members, their own union members who work for the AFL-CIO, And during two days of talks this week, the AFL-CIO had to propose a revised contract uh, that they proposed on Tuesday. The last deal that they had with their own union expired back in February, and this proposal from the AFL-CIO, the one they made in September, was overwhelmingly rejected by 97% of their members. The vote on this uh, latest proposal that was made on Tuesday of this week is expected by early next week. So uh, again, really interesting that even the unions are having problems with their own unions uh, yeah. striking or, or or picketing them, which could lead to another strike. Yeah, you know, I have a solution for that, Bert, um, and it, it will match my solution for health care, right? I believe all American citizens should have the same health care benefits that our Senate gets, and that solves that problem. And Senate may vote on whatever those benefits are, and we will follow suit. That's one. And I think the AFL-CIO 
um, employees um, who are picketing and fighting for their wages and, and their rights um, should get the very same benefits uh, and pay increases that the auto workers get solved. You just say, whatever we get out of the auto strike, we'll give to you all. And I think they'll be very happy and pleased with that as well. So I'm, they I'm, can. I'm sure they would be. It's yeah. uh, it's interesting because when the AFL, and I think you're, you're bringing home the point, Phil, is that the AFL CIO, when they put their employer hat on versus their union hat on, right. they don't want to give their own employees anything more uh, than, than they have to. And That's exactly uh, you know, right. Yeah. So your your point is well taken. Sticking with unions, let's let's stay on this uh, on this uh, topic. Uh, really, really interesting here. There was this uh, study. Bloomberg just released a study uh, saying that um, as the United Auto Workers leaders consider expanding the union strike against the big three automakers, uh, they they've idled 146,000 workers. Well, I'm sorry, they've idled quite a number of workers uh, already. But if all 146,000 uh, union workers at the big three would strike, there would be a huge, huge impact. Interestingly, in this Bloomberg study, strikes have idled more than 467,000 unionized workers so far this year. The year-to-date total is already twice 2022's total, four times larger than 2021 and eight times larger than 2020. Yeah. There are there have been 263 strikes called so far this year that have put uh, that puts 2023 mm -hmm. on a pace for the most union initiated work stoppages since 2005. So uh, it, it's really That's uh, a lot. quite. Yeah, it's huge. Yeah. Uh, again, when you talk about almost a half a million workers in this country have been idled by strikes. And what's making the strikes this year so impactful is their size. Uh, yeah. Obviously, this is skewed quite a bit by the uh, auto workers strike, but you're talking roughly very close to half a million people who have been on the picket lines this year. And uh, that that is really quite large. So again, the, you know, in a, in a couple of the largest ones, uh, the uh, entertainment industry, the 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 film and TV producers, uh, Kaiser Permanente strike, Los Angeles School District, and then of course the big three automakers. So uh, really, quite a lot a going lot on. People. Yep, quite a lot a going lot on in the uh, in in the union uh, sector. Very interesting for labor and employment lawyers such as Jim and me. Uh, and management associations and HR like you, Phil, to be keeping our eyes on. Yeah, you know, Bert, that's okay. We have uh, half a million people out on strike is what you said, but we still have 9.4 job opening, 9.4 million job openings and only 6.4 million people on unemployment. So even if we employed all the unemployment uh, that we have, we're still going to have a gap of about 3 million job openings. So there's plenty of jobs for them to go out and take if they don't like the job that they have. Makes it pretty easy uh, in my book to do that math. But we're really talking about leverage, aren't we? And that's, you know, that's when unions are going to strike is when they have leverage and with the economy and and because of those numbers I just shared where people can't be hired uh, because they don't exist, uh, that's when the union has leverage and that's when they're going to they're going to use that leverage to their advantage. Well, and Phil, the problem is actually worse than you even just identified, because we've got all these uh, people out there who are still unemployed, but their skill sets don't match up with where those jobs are. Yeah. And so oh, there, absolutely. There's, yes. there's really a disconnect. Uh, on on the people who are available employ for employment in the places that want to employ them. But I've got a solution for that. Maybe the five to six million workers that just disappeared from the workforce during COVID, maybe they'll get themselves back in the game one of these days. Yeah, well, I'm not sure if they're going to. I think they've retired, Bert, and, and they're done. They don't come back um, usually after after that level of retirement. And um, the number is going to continue to dwindle um, from that standpoint. And it's one of my favorite topics to talk with uh, you and other HR professionals on. There is the only solution to this problem is is one of two things, and we don't want a very serious, very deep, long-lasting recession and or immigration, and I have zero confidence that we're going to see any resolution with immigration abilities in the U.S. So with that, we're just going to have to keep fighting the good mm -hmm. fight. I don't see it being solved any other way. 
Um, but nevertheless, anything else from lawyer on the clock, Bert? No, I think we've covered uh, covered it. Is is well. <laughs>